Good day to you ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Workman, uh, biology teacher at Downers Grove South High School. Uh, and this is Basic Biochemistry Screencast Segment 6. Let's get into it right away here. So uh, we're going to go to slide 50 here. As you begin working through this segment, uh, make sure that you have some notes, uh, note paper available so you can take some notes. You might want a periodic table available to reference. And um, if you have any class notes on this or any of the lab or enrichment experiences based on some of the uh, items contained within this presentation, uh, you might want to have those two to add to your notes or supplement your notes. This starts off with a, a quick movie, so let me get into the movie here, of course, and it's Why is Water Essential for Life? Here we go. You probably have figured out that water equals life. To begin with, it is the perfect medium in which life can form and reform. But why? What properties of water make it the fluid of life? Water has a very important role in all of the chemistry that happens. A huge array of materials will dissolve in water. And because water enables other things to dissolve in it, it provides a medium where those things can recombine and form new chemicals. Water takes a kind of divide and conquer approach to breaking down other chemicals. In the case of table salt or sodium chloride, Water's negatively charged oxygen atoms surround the positive sodium ions, while the positive hydrogen atoms surround the negative chlorine ions. By splitting the two elements apart, water literally breaks down the structure of the salt. Moreover, because water remains liquid at the conditions of the surface of the Earth, you can move around in all different kinds of directions. That's called degrees of freedom. So things can move around, flip around, vibrate, stretch, rotate, and then they're able to try novel combinations and hook up in new ways. This surely helped life get started on the early Earth. The chemicals, the raw ingredients that make up life were constantly sloshing around, bumping into each other, and combining into new chemistry. Over millions of years, that process can lead to living organisms. But to really see water's life-giving function, we need to check in with the plant kingdom. In a plant. Okay, so that's enough for that for now. What I want to do is get back into this. And make sure that we're on the right slide here, of course. And we're going to go right to slide 52 and discuss this. Now, this shows uh, a hydration shell is what it's called, a water molecule surrounding a sodium uh, ion. Do you see how the oxygen side of these water molecules are surrounding the positive sodium ion? Let's look at this in more detail. Now, this has a web link to it, so I'm going to click on this, and this will take us to a web link uh, if I can get it to open. on. <laughs> there we go. And let's look at this. Let's start our movie here. Here's some salt. Dump some salt into water. Look at what happens. The water is acting as a solvent. The salt is a solute. And as you can see, water molecules can actually pull the sodium away from the chloride. And the oxygen side of the water molecules surround the sodium. The hydrogen side of the water molecules surround the chloride. And literally what happens is the water molecules cause the sodium and the chloride ions to no longer be associated with one another. We call that dissociation. If enough water molecules are present, they can completely surround these ions and form what's called a hydration shell. And this completely prevents this positive ion and the negative anion from refinding one another. And when that happens, we say, the compound has dissolved. So that is why water can be what's called a good solvent. I mean, that's one of the great things about water is that it dissolves things, and all these things can be floating around in water, and living organisms can use these ions that are dissolved in water as they need to. 
This is another diagram of the same thing. And if you have enough water, you can dissolve a lot of salt. But at some point, if you add too much salt, there aren't enough water molecules to surround the ions, and not all your salt will dissolve. Let's take a look at some key vocabulary here. A solution, of course, is a mixture of a dissolved solute and the water. Uh, and the solute, of course, is that solid that has dissolved. When we take a look at salt water as an example solution, the salt, the sodium chloride, is acting as a solute, whereas the water is acting as a solvent. Now, how come some things dissolve and some things don't? Well, one of the reasons that things can dissolve is because of the way that they're constructed. Materials that are going to interact with water are said to be hydrophilic. Hydro means water, and philic means attracted to or uh, agreeable with. So salt is an ionic compound, and that is said to be a hydrophilic material. Um, not all materials that aren't ionic compounds are going to be hydrophilic, but some are. As long as molecules that have uh, some polar covalent bonds, and you guys should know what these are, these are bonds in which you've got a moderate difference in electronegativities between atoms. It'll dissolve in water. So salt, which is an ionic compound, can dissolve in water. Sugar has some polar bonds in it, so it'll dissolve. And even proteins can dissolve in water. In contrast, hydrophobic materials are substances that won't associate with, or won't mix with, or won't dissolve in water. And these are going to be mostly molecules that contain mostly nonpolar covalent bonds. If you know about the bonding between carbon and hydrogen, there's only a slight electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen, so they share electrons pretty evenly when they bond, and so the result is they have nonpolar covalent bonds. Oils and fats and waxes, these are all types of uh, lipids, as we call them. They do not dissolve in water because they are, by and large, mostly made up of carbon and hydrogen bonded to each other or one another. Now this is an important diagram because this shows you another type of compound that can act uh, or change a solution in a significant way. Um, if you know about HCl, when you add it into water, it is going to be not called hydrogen chloride any longer, it will be called hydrochloric acid. And the reason why is that these bonds are going to be broken, these will dissociate just like the sodium and chloride would in the previous slides, into hydrogen and chloride ions. And when you add more hydrogen to solution, that's what makes a solution acidic or it makes the pH go down. <clears throat> Water itself even can fall apart in itself. Uh, so if you take a look at this H2O molecule, it can actually ionize itself uh, and fall apart into what's called a hydroxyl. Here's this hydroxyl right here and a hydrogen ion. And the thing that makes really uh, makes solutions really interesting is whether or not there's an equal number of these. Now, if you have an equal number of OH minus and H plus, that doesn't affect anything because what they'll do is just fall apart randomly and then recombine into pure water molecules again. However, if there is an imbalance of H and OH minus, then we're gonna have something change. And that change is measured by this thing called a pH scale. Now, did you notice that this is a lowercase p and this is an uppercase h? There's a reason. So let's look at this video, and I have this video loaded up ready here. Um, I'm going to exit out of this and play this. Water can act as either an acid or a base. When a water molecule gives up an H plus ion to become an OH minus ion, it is an acid. And if it accepts an H plus ion to become an H3O plus ion, it is a base. This process occurs naturally, even in the purest of water, but only in fractions of amounts. With pure water, the amount of H3O plus ions is 10 to the minus 7 mole per liter, or 1 10 millionth of a mole per liter. Although these are incredibly small amounts, they are measurable and determine whether a solution is an acid or a base. In 1909, a Danish biochemist, Soren Sorensen, 
proposed a way of measuring the concentration of H3O plus ions in solutions, and in the process, measure their acidity and basicity. It is known as the potential hydrogen, or pH, scale. This is the pH scale. Some common solutions and products are listed above. The pH scale is in the center, and the measure of H3O plus is shown below. The pH scale is a measurement of the amount of H3O plus ions in the solution. Water is 10 to the minus 7 mole. The others range from 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 14. The pH number comes from the exponent. Notice that water with a pH of 7 is right in the middle of the scale. All of the solutions lower than 7 are acids, and all those higher than 7 are bases. Lemon juice, for example, is an acid. It has a measure of about 10 to the minus 2.5 H3O plus ions in the solution. On the pH scale, lemon juice measures 2.5. Bleach, on the other hand, is a strong base and measures 12.5 on the pH scale. What you just saw is actually a pretty bad lab technique. You're not ever supposed to dip pH paper into a solution. You're supposed to take a glass stir rod, get a droplet of your solution, and then touch the glass stir rod to pH paper on the top of your um, lab bench. Uh, but one thing you should notice is that this high pH turned the pH paper this bluish, dark bluish color, and the low pH turned the pH paper a, uh, a red. It's about 10 to the minus 12.5 H3O plus ions in the solution. At first glance, the pH scale seems complicated, but it is really an ingenious measurement of the acidity and basicity of compounds and a very useful chemistry tool. Okay, so back to our slideshow. <clears throat> Let's get to the right slide. That's not the right slide, sorry everybody. So here's our pH scale. Do you notice over here you got more H plus and less OH minus? Right? See this tiny little area here that's devoted to OH minus and this large area here devoted to H plus. Whereas if you look over here, you got less H plus and more OH minus. Do you remember what this OH minus is called? That's right, it's called hydroxyl. Now, when you have a relatively equal amount of H plus and OH minus, what happens is they can recombine and to form a pure water molecule. This is how we define pH 7. That's a neutral pH solution. If you've got more H plus concentration than you do OH minus in a solution mixture, if you have more H plus, you have an acid solution, which means a pH of less than seven. If the reverse is true, if you have more hydroxyl than you do H plus ions, you have a basic solution, which means a pH of above seven. Take some time and write these statements down right now. Press pause, write these statements down. You need to know this. So here's a diagram uh, with some common substances. You might be able to find any of these or all of these in your home. Uh, and these are their representative pHs, lemon juice about pH 2, and wine. I would not recommend that you try this until you're 21, of course. Um, and <clears throat> one of the effects of a low pH, uh, an acidic solution, is a is a sour taste. So if you enjoy uh, vinegar uh, on your salad as part of your salad dressing, the reason why it's sour is because it has a lower pH. Uh, <clears throat> high pH materials are often slippery. Uh, so soap or uh, detergent can feel very slippery and the reason why it's slippery is because it's basic. It's critical for cells to balance the pH uh, and you know the function of what's happening inside of the cells. Certain reactions are possible, certain reactions are not possible at certain pHs. 
there's a need for cells to be able to regulate the pH of intercellular fluid, you know, blood, and even the cell fluid within the cell, we call that cytoplasm. This is some review uh, websites that you might consider taking a look at as you go through the concepts covered in this screencast. Thanks for listening, everybody.